Hello everybody in a book tube. I'm going to do a haul. I bought quite a lot of books in February. I was a bit naughty because I didn't read as many as I wanted to. But I'm going to show you which ones I've got. So we'll start with a few Marilyn ones I've got. So I did get this great big hefty book called Marilyn Monroe's Film Co-Stars from A to Z by David Allen Williams and it goes uh, from the beginning of a career to 1960. So sadly it doesn't include the cast of Something's Got to Give which was a final and finished film but it does um, do all the others. Now I have only had a quick flick through. There are pictures of the co-stars, there are pictures of Marilyn. It's one of those books that I'm just going to put to one side and dip into every now and again and just read a few pages like because I'm not going to sit and read this from cover to cover, it's going to be a bit boring. But I might think, oh, do you know what, I'm going to have a quick look. We've got a dedication, acknowledgement, contents, and then also by, and he's done quite a lot. Introduction, which I've actually already read. And then it goes on to the first person. So the first person is Dorothy Adams. It tells you a little bit for, about her, where she was born and when. And then it tells you a list of her film credits and it tells us that she appeared in Hometown Story in 1951 with Marilyn Monroe and that she was an instructor at UCLA Theatre Arts and that when she died uh, and where and when. So it's very interesting if you know if you're researching a biography of Marilyn and you want to talk about some of her co-stars that's a book to get. Another book I've got is this tiny tiny little one it's tiny it's called The Unremarkable Death by, of Marilyn Monroe Elton, by Elton Townend Jones and it's published by Samuel French because it is a play it, it um, premiered at the uh, Edinburgh Fringe so it's a one, act, a one person play and says do you know anything about me the real me before her she was the most famous of movie star in the world, famous for all the wrong reasons, her image, her sex appeal, her frailties and her failings, for her love affairs, her lateness on set and her drug dependency. For decades the sensation surrounding her death has eclipsed the sensation of her life, but no one knows what events led up to that fateful night in August 1962 when Marilyn Monroe was only 36 years until now. The unremarkable death of Marilyn Monroe recognises and investigates the truth behind the makeup to reveal a Marilyn never before seen, alone in only her dressing gown, no glitz, no glamour, no masks, Overdosed on pills, the woman behind the icon drifts back through her life and the memories of those she loved the most, revealing a frustrated intelligence. She exposes the truth behind her legend, leading us in real time to the centre of her psyche, the truth of her being and the moment of her demise. So I don't believe this goes down the murder route. I think it just uh, it's just her talking uh, to the audience. So it's not going to take me long to read that one. So who knows when I'm going to read that, but it's not going to be very long. I have two copies of the next book <laughs> and that is when Marilyn, when Marilyn Met the Queen by Michelle Morgan. Now you may be thinking why do you have two copies of that book? Well I was sent a copy by the publisher to review and this is that, that copy as you can see it's got a lot of tabs in it which has got a lot of inf information in it that I can just quickly jump to. There's my letter from the publisher which is very nice and in it it says um, it wasn't just the general public who went overboard. Nightclubs, theatres, some accounts played host to a lot of contests and look like Scala. In March 1956, a Marilyn wiggle competition in Airdrie, Scotland caused scenes which had to be seen to be relieved with hundreds of dancers rioting outside the town hall after they refused entry. The eight young women who entered refused to take to the stage. Uh, and then Peterborough Town Hall did one. Uh, a nobly needs competition uh, for the fellas and a Marilyn Monroe lookalike contest for the girls. <laughs> so there's all this. Uh, another one that she mentions is a thing that travelled around seaside towns. Um, she picks Cromer because it's a place she knows a lot and goes to. And it says about how they had a Do You Have Marilyn's figure. So not necessarily look like her, it wasn't a look like competition, it was to see if you had the same sort of figure as she did. And they had like cutouts of these girls. Uh, of Marilyn's figure and they then had to try and stand in the figure and fit um, and it went around the country so she uses chroma now I know they went to painting because obviously in 1956 when this happened my mother and her father my granddad obviously and her brother John would have gone to painting and there are slides of it and they are actually in here um I don't know if it's my mum though. Uh, let's see if I can find one. I brought them up because I know, oh here's one. You can see it really well. I don't know if you'll be able to see it on this camera but I will be scanning it. It's not brilliant and if I turn it this way 
I don't know if it'll focus. It probably won't. Let me just put my hand behind it for a minute so I try and get it to focus. It does actually show, um, are you the Venus of painting or something? But you can actually see Marilyn's figure and legs and everything. So it was from the same competition. I will be scanning those to send to Michelle at some point. That's why I've got the, the thing out. Uh, and, and of course I pre-ordered a copy back in January 2021 when it was first announced and listed on Amazon and this is that copy. So this will be a general reading copy for when I want to just read it and have fun. This will be a copy that I use when I want to research certain parts of it. There's lots of bits in it so um, the, the guy that was her pianist he would come play the piano at uh, Parkside for her. They never talked about the film and Marilyn he saw the film because he was given such hassle because he got to be close to it and people were jealous and that's really sad because his stories are some of the best in there. So those are the Marilyn books. Let's move on to all the books I bought from the second hand shops. So these are from charity shops. And there's quite a few. So the first one I've got here is The Cozy Tea Shop in the Castle by Kathy Brett. Was it, was it by, by Caroline Roberts? I have to look. So that's this one. Uh, can Ellie bake her way to a happy ever after? When Ellie lands her dream job running the little tea shop in the beautiful but crumbling Claverham Castle, it's the perfect escape from her humdrum job in the city. Life is definitely on the rise as Ellie replaces spreadsheets with scones and continues her nana's brilliant baking legacy when Lord Henry, the stick-in-the-mud owner, threatens to burst her baking bubble with his old-fashioned ways. Ellie wonders if she might have bitten off more than she can chew. But cupcake by cupcake, she wins the locals over, including tea shop store with Doris at Ellie's show-stopping bake set. Looks set to go down in castle history. Now all that's missing in Ellie's life is a slice of romance. Can Joe, the brooding estate manager, be the one to put the cherry on the top of Ellie's dream? Just a simple, cosy romance. Nice. Completely different. The Templar Cross. This is by Paul Christopher. I love these sorts of books. I call them historical archaeological adventures. They're sort of like Tomb Raider type stuff with a bit of mystical paranormal thrown in, usually. Uh, Army Ranger Lieutenant Colonel John Doc Holliday is teaching at West Point when he receives desperate news. His niece Peggy has been kidnapped while joy joining an ancient tomb excavation in Egypt. Another reason to find it, Egypt. Holiday immediately sets out to locate and rescue her, but Peggy's captors belong to the Brotherhood of the Temple of Isis. Ooh. Murderous fanatics who worship a dead god. Actually, dead goddess, because Isis is a goddess. A trail of clues sends Holiday deep into Africa and into the heart of a conspiracy involving an ancient Egyptian legend and the darkest secrets of the Order of the Templar Knights. So, ah, I love these kind of books. That's not a one I bought in a charity shop. That is a brand new one. Don't know why that's there. Oh, that's a new one as well. Next, Nice Work If You Can Get It by Celia Imrie. She's an actress, a UK actress. Very famous over here. Tucked between glitzy Monte Carlo in the red carpets of Cannes, Bellevue sur Mer, so Bells on the Sea, or Bellevue on the Sea, seems like the perfect place for an enterprising band of inhabitants to open a restaurant. Happily exiled from demanding families, they have found peace on Provencal cooking in the cobbled streets and azure vistas of their new home. But all is not as rosy as it seems, for soon it becomes clear that someone is trying to sabotage their project. Meanwhile, at the Cannes Film Festival is in full swing. Celebrities are flying in, luxury yachts arriving, as the excitement spills over into Bellevue sur Mer. The residents realise that they are embroiled in something much murkier than they could have imagined. And the race is on to get the restaurant open in time. So it's very witty, which I would expect nothing less coming from Celia Imrie. So I'm really looking forward to that one. I picked up the box of delights illustrated by Quentin Blake because, well, it's illustrated by Quentin Blake. Don't really know anything about this. I just love the uh, I love his artwork, so I thought I'd pick it up and I'd give it a read. So the walls are running, and the evil Abner Brown and his gang are on the prowl. They're after a magical box, but Kay has it, and he'll fight to keep it. That's it. A magical tale of walls, scrobbling, and a box that can travel through time. Companion to the Midnight Folk, two of the greatest children's books ever written. I've not read the Mid Mid Midnight Folk, but I will pick it up if I see it, but I just love the cover. 
The next one I picked up just simply because of the title and then I read back and I thought, oh, oh, oh yes, please, I'm having that, you're coming with me. And that is The Reader on the 627 by Jean-Paul, and I am not even going to try and pronounce his surname because I don't want to butcher it. But anyway, it actually doesn't say anything on the back, it was actually on the inside cover. Love is a journey. Ghislaine Vignol lives on the edge of existence, working at a book pulping factory in a job he hates. He has but one pleasure in life. Sitting on the 627 train each day, Ghislaine recite, recites aloud to a rapt audience from pages he has saved from the jaws of the pulping machine. But it's when he discovers the diary of a lonely young woman, Julie, a woman who feels as lost in the world as he does, that his journey will truly begin. I just love the concept of that. He, works, he hates it, he loves reading. Yeah. So he rescues pages and reads them to people on the train on his way home from work. Oh, it just sounds so beautiful. I can't wait to start this. It might be one of my next reads. In fact, I know it's going to be one of my next reads. Next, we've got Carol Matthews. It's Now or Never. I just love the title because obviously Elvis. Obviously, it's nothing to do with Elvis, but I still like the cover. When twins Annie and Lauren attend their older sister Chelsea's 40th birthday party at the Dorchester Hotel, they wonder why their lives are so different. Why is Chelsea's devoted husband twirling around the dance floor while Annie's husband has gone fishing and Lauren's lover is at home with his wife and children? There and then they decide it's time to turn things around, to go all out for what they want and to start living again before it's too late. But the question is, have they left it too late? So... Yeah, just a fun, quick romance, I would imagine. Bit of Neil Gaiman next graveyard book. Again, I love this cover. And again, this was, a, this was, I bought this in the charity shop. I bought six books for £1.25. Was it £1.25? £1.50. No, £1.25. They were like, so cheap. Uh, yeah, I, I can't get over how cheap these books were. And another charity shop, they're a pound. But I still don't mind paying because it's for charity. Anywho, uh, I'm sure you all know this one. Nobody Owens, known to his friends as Bod, is a normal boy. He would be completely normal if he didn't live in a graveyard being raised and educated by ghosts. There are dangers and adventures for Bod in the graveyard, but it is in the land of the living that real danger lurks, for it is there that a man named Jack, the man Jack lives, and he's already killed Bod's family. I don't like the sound of that. But it's Neil Gaiman, so I know it's going to be good. I love Neil Gaiman, love good omens. Uh, well, that's with Pratchett, of course, I'm going to love it, but hey. Um, I then got, oops, that one just hit the deck. I'm putting them on me to be read, shall soon. Anyone for seconds? Laurie Graham. Again, picked it up in the charity shop, thought it looked interesting. Uh, life has been going downhill for ex-TV chef Lizzie Partridge ever since she threw her chocolate mousse at the host of Midlands this morning live on air. Her partner Tom has left her and now a newspaper cookery column has been axed. Can things get any worse? In a desperate mood for sympathy and attention, she runs away from the gas bill and the mouse under the sink, and in a wet and windy Aberystwyth, she experiences a brush with her past and a glimmer of new prospects. So when her nephew's TV producer girlfriend has the bright idea to reunite her with her former nemesis, the target of the moose attack, in a new show, it looks as though her luck me might be about to change. Will Lizzie rejoin the upper crust, or will her renaissance prove only half-baked? I just love these books. They're so quick to read. I can usually sit down and read these in a couple of hours. Always good to top up your Goodreads challenge with, if you're doing it. I then picked up two books that are set around the Christmas period, just because they were there and they looked interesting. A lot of these books will be going to my mum and dad to read afterwards, so if they're sort of like thrillers, they'll go to my dad, and if they're the romance, it's good to my mum. So the first one I got is Underneath the Christmas Tree by Heidi Swain pretty pretty cover <laughs> can the festive spirit find a way into lizzie's liza's heart sorry this year winter's trees is the home of christmas but for liza winter it is a millstone around her neck the christmas tree farm was her father's pride and joy but now he's gone and she can't have anything to do with it until her father's business partner decides to retire and she must go back to handle the transition to his son ned when Liza arrives, she discovers a much-loved business that's flourishing under Ned's stewardship, and she's happy to stay and help for the Christmas season. But then she has other plans. Will the place where she grew up make her change her mind? And can it weave Christmas cheer around her heart? So that sounds like a nice little book. If I don't get it till next Christmas, it doesn't really matter, but I'll read anything any time of the year. Next. 
Silent Nights Christmas Mysteries edited by Martin Edwards. So these are short, these are novellas and they're mystery novellas which is good. This book does not look like it's been read. Look, the spine's hardly been cracked. There's a couple of pages that have got their corners turned but not. it's not that they've been dogged, it's just happened somehow. But I just love the look of the book. And the back of the book says Christmas is mysterious as well as magical time of year. Strange things can happen and helps to explain the hallowed tradition of telling ghost stories around the fireside as the year draws to a close. Christmas tales of crime and detection have a similar appeal. When television becomes tiresome and party games pall, the prospect of curling up in the warm with a good mystery is enticing and much better for the digestion than that another helping of plum pudding. <laughs> Crime writers are just as susceptible as readers to the countless attractions of Christmas. Over the years, many distinguished practitioners of the genre have given us one or more of their stories, a Yuletide setting. The most memorable Christmas mysteries blend a lively storyline with an atmospheric evocation of the season. Getting the mixture right is much harder than it looks. This book introduces readers to some of the finest Christmas detective stories of the past. Martin Edwards' selection blends festive pieces from much-loved authors with one or two stories which are likely to be even feel unfamiliar to even die-hard mystery fans. The result is a collection of crime fiction to savour whatever the season. Sounds good. I have no idea what's in here. I haven't looked. Is there a list? So we've got uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. Ralph Plummer, Raymond Allen, G.K. Chesterton, Edgar Wallace, H.C. Bailey, J. Jefferson Fargion, Dorothy Sayers, and so on. Yeah, that looks really good. So, hmm, Christmas mysteries coming my way. Right, that is all the second-hand books, so on to the new ones. I'm going to showcase this one next. Is it this one? Yeah. Two Doors Away by Elle Spellman. This is new. This only came out on the 24th of February. I bought this because I know the author. I know a lot of authors. I actually do know a lot of authors. I actually worked with this author uh, a few years ago. Well, a long time ago now, but we're still friends. And uh, she's a great girl. I wanted to, to, she's got, this is her third book, I think. And I haven't bought any of them. So I thought I'll get this one and then I'll get the other two. So this will be one of my permanent collection because if a friend of mine writes a book, I kick by it and I keep it. But let's see what it's about. So since moving to a new city, once adventurous Steph is doing her best to prove everyone back home that her life is as fulfilling and envy inducing as ever. The truth she's broke and finding that making new friends isn't as easy as she expected. Eric has lost his way in life since his breakup with perfect Clarissa. Now that all his friends are settling down, Eric's still living in a house share feeling left behind. Eric and Steph are lonely. They're strangers, but with one connection. They live on the same street on either side of number 26. Though neither has met their shared neighbour, they both used to take comfort in hearing the piano on the other side of the wall, as it made them feel less alone. Now the music stopped and number 26 lies silent. Brought together by mutual concern, Eric and Steph begin to grow closer and it looks like they might discover the solution to their problems could have been just two doors away the whole time. So I like the idea, I like the cover, I think it's really sweet. I'm looking forward to getting started on this. This is definitely gonna be read in March. I uh, got a few from the works, uh, which I'll do in a minute. Uh, but now the classic for March, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I don't need to tell you about this. You know about this. I have never read it. This is again, one of the Penguin's cloth bound classics. I am going to have to peel the price label off the back. I don't know if I did that with Dracula. I probably did. It's definitely gone now. I hate labels. Don't we all? I don't take them off my cheap works books because I don't normally keep them. They go to my dad and mum and then they go to the charity shop. Unless it's a permanent one. So, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I got Harlan Coben Play Dead. Who doesn't like a bit of Harlan Coben? On this one, ex fashion model and successful business woman Laura Ayers is on her honeymoon when her perfect world is shattered. Her sports superstar husband goes for a swim and never returns. But what has happened to David? Can he really be dead? Questioning David's mysterious disappearance, Laura begins to uncover a conspiracy which reaches deep into the past and is now slowly beginning to destroy everyone involved. Mm. Someone will do anything to keep Laura away from the awful truth and she has no idea who she can trust. Classic Harlan Cohen. One of the ones that's been doing the rounds on booktube and TikTok is The Silent Patient by Alex Michelades. I uh, picked this up because I heard a lot about it on there. I thought it sounds good. Uh, so I thought I'd give it a try. So Alicia Berenson lived a seemingly perfect life until one day six years ago when she shot her husband in the head five times, as you do. 
Since then she hasn't spoken a single word and it's time to find out why. This is one of those floppy ones. It's just to do with the way it's bound. But hey. Again, another one that's been popular on TikTok and Booktube is the X-Hex. So Vivian Jones handled the biggest breakup of her life the way that any witch would. Vodka, bubble baths and a curse on her ex. That was nine years ago. Now Reese Pinhallow, descendant of the town's founders, breaker of hearts and still irritatingly gorgeous, is back. Reese has returned to the quaint town of Graves Glen to recharge the ley lines and make an appearance at the annual Fall Festival. But when his every move results in calamity, Vivi realises that Hex and her ex might not have been so harmless after all. As the curse starts to affect the magic of the town, resulting in a murderous wind-up toys, an outraged ghost, and a surprisingly talkative cat, Vivi and Reese must put their personal feelings aside and work together to break the curse and save not just the town, but Reese's life. I like to say that. That's the sort of thing I would pick up on Kindle Unlimited, so a bit of fun. This one will be joining the permanent collection, even though it's still got its label on it, um, and it's People of Abandoned Character. Again, this one's been on BookTok. By Claire Whitfield. I looked at the back and I saw it said London 88. I thought, oh no, I've got to read that. It's historical. And then I thought, hang on, London 1888. It's got to have Jack the Ripper connection. Of course it does. So of course that's why it's going in the permanent collection. So Susanna rushes into marriage to a young and wealthy surgeon. After a passionate honeymoon, she returns home with her new husband wrapped around her little finger. <laughs> but then everything changes. His behaviour becomes increasingly volatile and violent. He stays out at night, returning home bloodied and full of secrets. Lonely and frustrated, Susanna starts following the gruesome reports of a spate of murders in Whitechapel. But are the ki as the killings continue, her mind takes her down the darkest path imaginable. Every time he stays out late, another victim is found dead. Is it coincidence? Or is her husband the man the papers call Jack the Ripper? So of course, being a huge Ripperologist, I like to read anything Ripper related, even if it's fiction. So I thought I'd add this to my Ripper collection. I will be reading that as soon as I can, but I've still got a ton of Ripper books to read, so who knows when it's gonna be. Another one from the work three for five pound deal is Moon Over Studland Bay by Adela Galton. I love the cover, it's so shiny. <clears throat> so. Animal loving, Samantha Jones is on a mission to live the dream. Uninspired with her dull day job, Sam plans to expand Purbeck Pooches, her seaside pet sitting business into a full time career and embarks on a mission to find her perfect man. Sam soon hits trouble. Her boss accuses her of moonlighting, the perfect man is frustratingly elusive and her parents make a shock revelation. The odds are stacking up against her, but Sam finds that sometimes when you reach for the moon, you get a handful of glittering stars thrown in for free. So it just sounds like a really nice cosy romance, curl up with hot chocolate and have a good read. Mm. We've got three left. Woohoo! We're getting it now. Again, these are all from the works. I do, I do a lot of shopping in the works. Can you tell? Uh, this one is Twice in a Lifetime by Helga Jensen. Uh, so let's see what this is about. After a messy divorce, the only relationship 48-year-old Amelia Simpson has enjoyed recently is with Nutella and Pinot Grigio. While her eight-year-old twin boys keep her busy, Amelia dreams of having a life more washing, more than washing muddy rugby kits. Who can blame her? So when Amelia rediscovers the phone number that was given to her 20 years ago by a handsome stranger in New York, she wonders whether or not he might be the one that got away. A worldwide social media campaign tracks down the mystery man and soon Amelia is on her way to the Big Apple. Has Amelia found the one or will she discover the sparkle she was missing is actually closer to home? Another rom-com, very nice. Next one is, there's only two more, hooray, it's been a long one, but you know, they're books and you know, you just can't have enough books in your life, can you? I don't think so. The Things We Never Say by Sheila O'Flanagan. Abby Anderson is stunned when she comes home to find her boyfriend has left her. She's never needed her mother more, but that door is firmly closed. Abby is feeling very alone. Then a charismatic Irishman appears on her Californian doorstep. Doorstep? Doorstep. With an astonishing revelation about her family. Soon Abby is on a flight to Dublin. That was enough for me. As I said, Irishman in Dublin, I was gone. Looking for answers to questions she never knew she should be asking. 
Across the Atlantic, Fred Fitzpatrick's adult children are oblivious to the shock heading their way. They're focused on their father, who is increasingly cantankerous in his old age. Sometimes it's only thoughts of his fortune that makes it bearable to live with him, but Fred's story is not the open book they all thought about thought it was, and nor is his will. Ooh, that sounds good. As a shadowy crime emerges from the past, ah, Abby and the strangers about to become a part of her life will say and do things they never thought they would. It could end in disaster or a surprising new beginning. Actually sounds really good, doesn't it? And the next one I bought simply because it had a picture of my bridge on it. It's my bridge, nobody else's bridge, it's my city that it's in, it's my bridge. <laughs> it's called Murder at the Gorge by Frances Evesham and it has a picture of the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol. <laughs> it's my bridge, it belongs to me, okay? Uh, I don't care what they say, it's not Bristol's, it's mine, okay? It's mine. Um, and obviously it's not set in Bristol, it's just, it's just, they just used it because it's a picture of the, uh, the gorge. <laughs> I'm just being fun, no. <clears throat> a joke, a prank, or something more sinister. When the Exum on Sea residents are targeted by anonymous emails containing apparently harmless nursery rhymes, no one knows whether to laugh or shudder until an unexplained death touches the town. Libby Forrest, baker, chocolatier, and Exum's very own resident private investigator, oh dear, alongside her partner Max Ramshaw, sets out to solve the puzzle before more people die. But when Max's ex-wife arrives on the scene ahead of Max and Libby's long-awaited nuptials, things go from bad to worse. With the town and their relationship under threat, Max and Libby need the help of the Exum History Society if they're going to find the nursery rhyme killer in time. If you like Agatha Christie style mysteries, then you'll love these intriguing whodunits. And there you go, that's all the books I got in February. Let the reading commence. I promise to try not to buy as many books in March. And I haven't got my fingers crossed, I have. Yeah. I'm not gonna promise anything about books because, you know, books. I won't be buying a classic in March. I'll be picking one off my TBR shelf to get rid of it. So, which books? Oh, I'm so excited for all these books. I must admit, obviously, Frankenstein, my friend Elle's book. Um, oh, just so excited. So, but let me know which ones, if you've read them, what you think of the ones you've read and which ones do you think I should read soon? <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you <gasps> oh, excuse me, if you stayed this long, well done. And I'll see you in the next one very soon. Bye.